Are you there, Riel? Can you hear me? Hello, Doc. How are you? Okay. Yeah, I got to do some stuff. Okay. I'll be back. Oh, Doc. Uh, Ariel, admit people, okay? Okay, okay. Great. <clears throat>
¿Qué te voy a decir? Ah, uh, Dr. Bennett, can you hear me? Hi, uh, Dr. Bennett, can you hear me? Yeah, how hey, are you how doing? You doing? Yeah, nice. You can see Uriel there too. Hi, how are you doing? Hello, hello, hello. Hola, John, ¿cómo estás? So, did you go for your run today? Yes, I did. I'm just in the hospital, huh? finishing the runs. Uh, how far did you run? Uh, today, 10K. Yeah. 10K. 10K. Wow, that's about yeah. six six miles, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I walked that far. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I mean, it's better than. No, than I walk. I can't run. Be I can't run because of my. Uh, I have a heart thing, but I walk six miles. But that okay. and that's and that's good because when you get older, you got to watch your legs, man. Yes, I see. I mean. It's good for the health of the joints. Also, there are some studies that promote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I yeah. feel great. I, you know, I hate it because I used to be used, used to hate old people that walked. Okay. Was, uh, get off the sidewalk. Get out of. I'm running. Get out of my way. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm one of the old guys. <laughs> yeah, but that's okay. I mean, even you have a beautiful landscape there on, on Miami. So <laughs> there's no oh, excuse to great, not go. It's for a great a walk. place. Yeah, yeah, I walk. I walk over the Venetian. Do you know Miami at all? No, no, actually, I haven't. Oh, okay. I haven't. A real. I walk through a real nice section. It runs by the ocean and boats and stuff. It's beautiful, beautiful walk. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's nice. And uh, uh, Miami is uh, hot all the all all year, right? Yeah, it, 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 no, it's not in in, the, in around December. It gets cool. Oh, cool okay. Jan yeah, not really cold, but a little cool. It wouldn't be cold, cool to you probably. But but uh, yeah, I understand about America. You know, when I deal with American neurosurgeons, I I know they have to be aware of privacy and security they have to be aware and, and yeah. the big one is liability people suing lawsuits because in in latin america they have what they call responsibilidad profesional which yes. means which means the doctor's not going to lose a lot of money 
maybe two hundred fifty dollars a thousand. That's it. But here they give away millions. Yeah. For malpractice, <laughs> so the you know doctors are very careful. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you for understanding. So, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's no big deal not having a copy, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the uh, Dr. Valdivia will be shortly in about ten minutes. Okay, uh, that's fine. We got yeah. lots of we got lots of time. Okay. Um, yeah, I got to do some things. I'll be back. Okay. Okay. Great.
Uh, hello, Dr. Valdivia. Welcome to uh, to this space. Um, I will promote you to panelist. Uh, oh, you are already a panelist. Okay. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, Dr. Valdivia. Welcome. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, Dr. Valdivia. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Valdivia. Hey, can how you are you? Yes. Hello. Welcome, Dr. Valdivia. We're just uh, waiting a little bit to people to finish login and then we okay. will get it started, okay? So today we have the presence of Dr. Bennett, who is the host of Neurosurgical TV. He actually provides us this space to reach out uh, the Dandy community at the global stage and some students in Peru as well. Perfect, Dr. Bennett, uh, well, welcome, thank you very much. Doc, you're up in Florida, right? Yeah, I'm in Tampa. Yeah, I'm in Miami, Miami, Miami Beach, just like you see in the background. That's right. That's right. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So I guess you're familiar with this platform, right? I am. I am. Okay. Yes, no video. You have any videos at all? Sometimes. I, I do. I do have some videos. Yeah. Okay. You want to go over them to make sure they're working okay and everything? Yeah. Give me one second. Um, yeah. I have some video and I have also um, a um, second. I have some yeah. 3D, 3D images to show. Uh, let me just share with you what I have. Yeah, yeah. take your time because uh, uh, people come late to these. Uh, so there's no hurry. Okay. So let's just go over it. Because yeah, I want to share my screen. Yeah, obviously that's an important part. <laughs> Okay, so let me show you what I have. I have some basic videos. I mean, this talk is directed to a medical student, so it's it has some 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 technicalities, but a lot of uh, general generalities as well. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see the video here. Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. Little... Okay. Can looks you hear me? Good. Yeah. Does it have audio? The video or just just a video? Um, I think when I play. When I play the video, give me one second. When I play the video, I'm going to cut the audio of the video like this. Yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah. It makes it, well, audio can be a problem. Yeah. So, let me just, so if uh, you can do it, I mean, if you need it, you need it. But if you don't really need it, then don't use it. I definitely don't need it. Uh, okay. I'm going to cut it. Uh, yeah. There's no, there's no, yeah. Okay. No reason to have it. So. Uh, and then let me see if um, I can share with you one second. Let me just get out of this video here. Uh, let me allow my rep from surgical theater to share his screen uh, and uh, where he's sitting next to me. Um, so it's Mike Miller, um, if you don't mind. Okay, Mike. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. So, and it's going to be oh, movement there, here. right? There's, there's going to be movement right there, right? Yeah, give me one second. Okay. Yeah, it's moving. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a little bit of a delay. Huh? Let's see. Oh, actually, no, there's no delay. Never yeah, I mean, there's slightly is if you watch, but not like major. Right, 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 right. So let's. Um, so, okay. It looks right. like it's responding okay, so the platform's working. Right, right, right. So now, um, give me one second. Let me talk to Mike. How do I show the uh, pelvic incidents and yeah, those right? I'm just gonna go through what we have here and make sure we're all um, there. You go. So. Right. So you see this wall here on the mouse? Right. Just click down on that and move the whole mouse in. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, show this side. 
Can I make it transparent so, so I can see the PI? Uh-huh, perfect. Yeah, okay. So, how big? What's the hell are you? Lumber lordosis, yeah. It's yeah. the blue. Yeah, it's probably it's the middle. Yeah, public incident. Yes, thank you. Actually, LL is uh, from five to one. I don't think we have that here. No, that's fine. Okay, uh, very good. Yeah, perfect. I think we are uh, we're good, so um, we can wait. Uh, Do you want these labels in there? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we can you can come out now if you want. Thank you, doctor. Okay, very good. We're about to start. You you ready? Yeah. So. We just uh, we wait a little bit for the rest of the members to log in. And yeah, then we yeah. Can get started. Sure. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Sure. No, there's no hurry. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Great. Um, uh, and jo John, this is uh, this is directed to mostly medical students, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the, most yeah. of the attendees are medical students. Yes. Perfect. They are finishing to fun. log in. Mm -hmm. um, I already talked to uh, Dr. Bennett about the confidentiality as well. So there won't there won't be any video that will be kept recorded on YouTube or nothing. It would just be broadcasted and, and that's it. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, um, it'll, it'll be fun. Uh, yeah, I, I'll make it very very. Um, I'll make I'll put some technicalities there, as I said for planning and spine surgery, but I'll make it entertaining enough so that it's stimulating for the the audience. Okay. okay. Wonderful. I will briefly share my screen. So we have some people from. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely have a couple of hundred people that watch them and that don't okay. really come into the panel. Okay. On yeah. YouTube and uh, and Facebook and stuff. So you'll get an audience. Okay, great. Mm. So. Wow. And so, I'll erase I'll erase the video after it's done. You know, okay, give me one second, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Ariel, are you there? Yeah. Hello, hello, okay. hello. Yeah, Ar Ariel's going to moderate, okay, John? Hello, everyone. Hola, yeah, no, yeah, no problem. And, and Hill, uh, do you want him to introduce you and you introduce the doctor or should Ariel uh, introduce actually, the doctor? I already, I already present, uh, prepared uh -huh. a, oh, okay. a presentation. Oh, okay. I introduce the channel and I introduce John and John introduce a, a su ponente. Okay, oh, so, you, so you guys are in agreement. You're you're gonna hand it off to after your introduction, right, Riel? Uh, uh, no sé qué opinas, John. ¿Cómo, cómo te gustaría? Yeah, so that's well. Okay. I don't know, uh, John. What do you want to do? Go, do you, I can, do you I can go introduce? directly. I can go directly straight to to uh, presenting the doctor, if that's okay. Okay, uh, Riel. Is that and, and, and probably uh, yeah, you can promote the channel as well at the at some point. Yeah. Dale. Okay. Okay. Perfecto. So. Yeah. So. Okay. okay so. Go. Okay. I introduce you first, Ariel. Uh, oh, no, doctor. No, I don't John. introduce. But <laughs> but you. Okay, Ariel. Don't you take. He you, wants, you, he okay. Wants to obviously. The the, uh, the dandy club and the and the presenter, Doctor Juan. So, uh, and then we we present the channel. You know. Okay. We'll just follow <laughs> what we do, John. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, great. Uriel, sounds, sounds Uriel, good. Uriel, I'm gonna go five, four, three, two, one, and then you go. Okay, Uriel. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, and, and then then you go where you want to go. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, bueno, entonces lo hacemos rápido, va? Y lo presento a John bastante rápido y John, tú empiezas a hacerlo, va? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, perfecto. So on your call, Doc. Okay. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. I'm not going to be on, so get my head off. Yeah. So let me get started. Uh, thank you for all the attendees to to be here today with us. Um, we are Dandi Peru, 
We're a club uh, founded on November 2020, and we have been uh, fostering medical education for our students uh, since that time. And we are uh, okay. Uh, hold on, glad. hold hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, I, I haven't entered. Okay, I haven't started yet. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, we'll start okay. again. There's like someone keeps putting the dandy sign up there. I don't know who it is, but uh, let's let's we got to introduce faces, not not banners okay okay is the doctor ready yeah so i, I actually uh, brought, uh sharing my screen there so i will then uh, present the doctor in the channel as well okay is, is the doctor there is he ready yeah the doctor start? is here yeah are you ready to start doc i'm ready when you are doctor okay five four three two one. Okay, th thank you for attending uh, today. Uh, we're on Neurosurgical TV. Um, thank you, Dr. Bennett, for the platform to broadcast this uh, episode or lecture series. Uh, we're glad to have uh, today with us um, uh, Dr. Juan Valdivia, who will be uh, presenting uh, our case. So, so, um, so, Dr. Valdivia, I will introduce yourself. Uh, I will introduce you, in, uh, but beforehand, I would like to say a, a couple of announcements. Please do not take pictures of images or videos that might contain uh, patient information. Uh, the questions can be written on the chat box or directly asked at the end of the presentation. And during the session, please keep your microphone off uh, so there won't be uh, interruptions. Um, Dr. Valdivia, um, completed his medical degree at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia in Lima, Peru. Uh, he went for a general surgery internship at the University of Illinois at Chicago, in Chicago. Uh, he completed his neurosurgical residency at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Then he underwent a, a training in complex and recon reconstructive spine surgery, fellowship at the University of Michigan in Ann, in Ann Harbor. Then he completed a fellowship at neurosurgical oncology at Emory University, and currently serves as a neurosurgeon at the Baker Health System in Tampa, Florida. He's associated with the American Association of Neurosurgical Society uh, Surgery, and he has founded uh, two communities uh, in the last years. The, the first one is uh, the United States Latin American Neurosurgical Community and the Spine Club. Besides that, Dr. Valdivia has represented our country in competitions of free driving. So we are, we are very excited to have Dr. Juan Valdivia today with us. Well, uh, Dr. Bennett, may I proceed? Yes, please. Thank you so much. That sounded like a lot. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of things that I've done, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just a neurosurgeon and I'm here to, to instruct the students since it's a, mostly a student audience about um, planning and spine surgery. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Bennett for allowing us to have this platform. It's very generous of you uh, and also the, the Dandy Club Peru. Uh, and the, the purpose of the talk is to uh, inspire you on how to uh, think and plan uh, spine surgery. Uh, and, and, and it's the, the general basis of what, from where you're going to build your knowledge, all the big algorithm of knowledge that you will build as a medical student, as a resident, as a fellow, uh, and as a young faculty. Um, so there's, there's some technical aspects of the talk and there's some general aspects of the talk, some ethical aspects of the talk as well. Uh, and, and yeah, without further ado, we'll just uh, proceed. Let me, uh, can I share my screen? Let me see. All right. So, um, so the, the purpose of the talk is to um, go over the assessment and planning for uh, spinal deformity surgery in, in adults. And uh, um, I have to give uh, acknowledgement to uh, Mike Miller, who is a senior uh, uh, program lead for surgical theater. This is a, a tool that I use for planning. 
not only for cranial surgery, for but mostly for spine. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm not showing any uh, any other products that are uh, pertinent of this stock. So, in general terms, uh, since most of you guys are medical students, uh, before you go into neurosurgery or spine surgery, you have to love what you do. Um, I think uh, the the basic. I gave this presentation at my alma mater online for uh, Universidad of Cayetano Rey in Peru, and you have to love it because a neurosurgery is not an easy job. Uh, neurosurgery is a tough job. Uh, you're going to be facing healthy patients, success patients, and sick patients, and you're going to be facing death. So you have to love it. Otherwise, you can be miserable. You have to love what you do, and you have to pick the branch in neurosurgery that you love to do and you know you will be good at. That's, that's number one. Uh, what I've learned in neurosurgery, um, more so after starting practice, is that uh, the patients do not have the privilege to be treated by us, but rather we have the privilege to treat the patients. And I think that's number one. And if, I think if you go into your practice with that mentality, you are going to be thankful of what you have, thankful of having the privilege to treat. Um, and I, personally, I, I try to act as if there's somebody watching me at all times and watching what I think and why I do things to a patient. That's very, very important. Uh, in, in neurosurgery. And for me, uh, before going to the operating room or, or, or the clinic room or the outpatient clinic, I tried to do this triangle of think that have been in the back of my mind that the relationship between patient and physician is, is number one. And that's a sacred relationship. And that's not a, 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 a trio of patient physician. And really it's not the law symbol. It's really uh, a greater force, whatever you believe in, it has to be within your ethics to treat a patient in need uh, because the patient comes to you because the patient doesn't know better. The patient needs help and guidance. And that's number one. Uh, so this patient, uh, physician patient relationship is sacred in neurosurgery, uh, especially more so when the physician uh, turns into the patient. And when you are the patient, you become the patient, then you really understand what I'm telling you now. Um, in medicine in general, now stepping back, uh, um, you have to really know what a, being a physician is to you. That's, that's very important because as you do neurosurgery, clip an aneurysm or, or do a spinal instrumentation or whatever, uh, really you're doing medicine. Uh, and there's, there's, um, there's a governing uh, group of thoughts and principles that you have to apply. And you really, want, you really need to know what's your reward. If your primary reward is to help others, then you will be very, very happy. Um, in general, we avoid, uh, we try to do, uh, to do uh, clinical unity is what we call the, uh, this. In Spanish, we used to call it like that in, back in medical school. You, treat, uh, you avoid treating only the films. You avoid treating yourself. If you have any concerns or anything, it's, just, it's really the patient what, uh, what is the priority. Uh, we treat patients and we don't treat films. We put patients first always. Uh, and their safety, and you become second. You know, it's it's. Let's face it. You you become second in the clinic. You become second in the OR, and you become second in the follow. -up. Always, the patient's always the first priority, and and, and you have to remember this is a service uh, uh, profession. You're serving the patient, and and it's very very interesting. Uh, so, something that really made me think of uh, how to do planning and spine surgery and why. The question of why is I saw this gentleman in Peru when I went to uh, back home to visit family and I just went to the Andes um, and I saw this gentleman coming down the stairs in a cathedral in Cusco and he took about 20 minutes to go from the top of the cathedral to the bottom of the cathedral with no walker and no uh, cane uh, and yeah and no, no assistance and he was selling and me as a spine surgeon with a special interest in uh, adult deformity, I saw him and I said, well, you have significant kyphosis. I almost wanted to help him because I felt he was going to you know, drop his uh, merchandise. And he told me basically to go away and to let him work. And then I understood a little bit better when you should treat and when you shouldn't treat. This patient has significant spinal deformity, kyphosis, positive sagittal balance, 
et cetera, et cetera. All these measures that we studied in med school and residency, but really he didn't want to be treated because he didn't have any complaints. He didn't have any pain. And this, this image symbolizes uh, that thought that we really treat patients. We don't treat films or parameters only, okay? Uh, in history, we have been uh, very enamored with the idea of the spine and biomechanics of the spine. And it's, it's, uh, it's very evident that it's a mobile uh, organ, it's a puzzle. And that's why a patient uh, you treat for spine on day one, it's a patient for life. Uh, because that, that organ is not an immobile organ. What happened to that spine depends not only on the parameters you see on x-ray, but it depends on the patient's age, weight, profession, activities, hobbies, et cetera, uh, sports, that's huge. And it's, it's a changing, it's a, it's a changing uh, curve. Uh, I always tell my patients to, um, or, my, or before my students to compare the anatomy of the human spine to the anatomy of uh, marine mammals, for example. And if you compare with this, the vertebrae of a, I believe this is of a dolphin, um, you'll see that it's uh, it's almost like a it's almost like the same organ but different proportions. It's like comparing a, a one car of brand A and a car of brand B and one car is going on a road and one car is going up the hill. Uh, so it's very interesting how uh, comparing to marine mammals, for example, the spine of the dolphin and spine of the human spine, it's almost the same organ, but we use it much differently. Uh, and that's why we have uh, back pain as one of the most important causes for visits to the doctor in the, in the world. Um, so uh, the, the reason why I show you all this is to have an idea of, uh, of how the human spine is used, abused, uh, and also treated uh, comparing to, uh, um, you know, through the whole range of, uh, of human existence, age groups and, and uh, backgrounds. Um, spinal biomechanics is very, very important. It's a very hot topic. And it's something that you have to, if you really want to understand the spine, uh, you have to make it a habit to try to understand each case, not just to look at, if you're looking at like a train, you're not, you're not looking at the wagon, you're looking at the whole train and how it's used in over time and looking at trends. Uh, before you uh, start planning spine surgery or trying to think about a case in spine surgery, try to do a very good physical examination, okay? Um, the the knee-jerk reflex of spine surgery is to look at a chart, look at a symptom, and then look at an MRI, and then you say, okay, this is the problem, let's fix the problem. But really examining someone with uh, for spine pathology is examining the patient from the TMJ all the way to the soles of the, the, the shoes. That's your physical examination for someone with spine pathology. Why? Because it's the, the spine pathology just doesn't live on the spine. It starts on the ground. It starts in the shoes, the soles, the ankles, knee mobility, ankle mobility, hip mobility, leg discrepancy, and then the spine. So you have to understand that before you try to come to conclusions. Someone may have a pathology on the knee or ankle or congenital pathologies in the ankle, uh, leg, length, leg length discrepancy. And that's very important. That's going to give you the answer of why this patient has that, uh, whatever they have, polystesis, scoliosis, uh, and how to prevent the issues in the future. That's very important. So if you're going to be a spine surgeon, you don't think that is very easy just to look at films and maybe make diagnosis over um, over the phone or um, over Zoom, because it may it may seem very easy, but really, if you really want to make a, a, a sound assessment, you have to examine somebody from looking at the shoe, at the sole of the shoe, you can tell when someone is wearing a shoe more than the other. And that will tell you a sign that you have to look into something else, okay? Um, we treat patients, not films, uh, a spine patient is a patient for life. Primo non uscere is number one. You cannot hurt a patient. Uh, in spine surgery, we learn tons of tons of tools. We have a huge armamentarium of tools from knowing how to do a laminectomy, MIS, fusion, deformity, and trying to uh, place a implant A to Z. But really, what you're treating is the patient. And be careful with thinking that, um, I always use this analogy, be careful of 
thinking that uh, because you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that is, it's, there's a fine line in spine surgery between uh, treating the patient or trying to use a tool. Okay, very important. Um, uh, learning how to operate, you will do it in residency. Um, everyone, everyone is going to be able to place a pedicle screw. That's not the issue here. The, the problem in spine surgery is not how to do things, it's when to do things and how, how you plan it. Um, in general, in spine surgery, you have to make a plan. Um, if, if, you, if you arrive to the spine surgery, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, pre-op planning or, uh, or the OR, and you arrive and you say, okay, let's see what are we doing today. That's not the right attitude. You have to have a plan. In spine surgery, the more complex the spine surgery, the, the more specific your planning and your timing needs to be because you have to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. Uh, if you, uh, this is the typical, the, the reason why we, we have this in place is to uh, diminish operative time, diminish anesthesia time. Therefore, the spine surgeon has to have all the tricks in the back ready to use. Plan A doesn't work, then plan B, and then plan C, and then plan D. But you have to have them thought out um, and you have to have them uh, planned already. Before spine surgery, I always use this plan. Uh, I, I measure instrumentation, measure where I'm going to do an opening, uh, open approach uh, or we'll see or MIS approach, where I'm going to do my laminectomy so that your engineering plan comes to fruition at the end of your surgery. And by the time you're closing, you know you, you achieved every single goal for that patient, whether it's decompression, indirect decompression, instrumentation, stabilization, et cetera. Um, in general, uh, the, the, the trend in spine surgery is, um, you know, you initially in residency, we learn how to put, for example, pedicle screws freehand where you don't use extra navigation, you don't use a robot, but you just use your mind. So you do on your mind what the robot is doing for you. You're having a three-dimensional visualization of the spine and you place hardware perfect without using x-rays in some cases of instrumentation, not in all levels, nor in all cases, but that's the basic of what you have to learn in residency is freehand technique for most issues. Like here, um, you just, you, you, spine surgery is, uh, is about tactile feedback, sound, and, um, and also, uh, force, you use significant force, uh, but with great control. Uh, when you're placing hardware on the spine, you, you feel how it's going and, and, you, and you sense, you hear how it's going. Even with the drill, um, that's something that you have to think and you have to remember. It's not just drilling a bone, it's hearing how the drill is going and feeling how the drill uh, is touching the, the structures. Um, I, I used to teach my residents that the uh, popular, um, it's like a woodpecker technique where you grab the drill with the fingertips and you can feel when you are in cortical bone, cancellous bone or your past bone. So you have to develop that, that tactile feedback. That, that is your workhorse, uh, uh, the, the labor of, of the surgeon, because it's really a craft, the spine surgery still. Um, you can go from there to use navigation, for example, as in this case, um, in which uh, we have uh, you know, some fancy tools to, to know exactly where we are in the spine. Uh, and, and that gives you some degree of uh, security on what you're doing. That, that tells you where you're placing what, that, that in general terms. And, and I'm sorry if I'm making this a very general talk, but these are basic, basic fundamentals that you have to have. As you can see, you can see the screen and you can see exactly where I'm putting a pedicle screw at the level of T1 in, in a, a cervical thoracic instrumentation. Uh, so that takes away of the surgeon, right? So if you see this patient, you may not be 100% sure, but then you're sure because you're looking at the films so that it makes it easier for you to place instrumentation or to do things on the spine. But don't, don't, don't be fooled by the tool, right? Tools are just tools, they're not surgeons. So you have to be able to function without these tools. Number one principle in spine surgery. You cannot depend on technology for everything you do. You have to be better than technology. Technology is great. You have to use it. You have to take advantage of it, but don't depend on it 100%. 
because the day where you, this is my personal opinion, okay? I'm not speaking for all spine surgeons, but uh, the day you, um, uh, you're using navigation to um, stabilize, let's say, uh, an unstable fracture, right? And, and you have to abort surgery because your navigation fails uh, and you fail to achieve the job or complete the job because you just don't have the tool that you need. Um, it's, it can be questionable. Uh, you have to try to save that patient's function. Uh, in, some time, in some cases, save the patient's lives. Uh, you can you can use a robot too. Robots are this nice marketing tool. It's great. It's accurate. It's a great tool, uh, but it doesn't do spine surgery for you. You know, it doesn't necessarily. Uh, at least uh, last time I checked the literature, it doesn't really give you better outcomes in all patients. Number one, uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily make you place a pedicle screw faster. Uh, I'm, I myself time myself with a robot, and I do it faster than the robot. Um, so you have to know when to use technology. That's basic, basic principle. Uh, now we're going to now into uh, going to the, the the meat of the talk. Um, spinal pelvic uh, measurements are very important in spine surgery because it tells you why a patient may fail in the future, why may, a patient may have a revision surgery in the future, uh, or adjacent level disease. Uh, and the basic ones are pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, sacred slope. SPA, there are things that you're going to learn in the literature. It really tells you how the patient is standing up and where are the, the relationships between the legs, the femurs, the, uh, the sacrum, the pelvis, and the lumbar spine. The very basic measurements that I use, and I try to use, do this on all my patients, whether I do surgery or not, uh, because some patients, I follow them over time. And I try to know, I try to predict if the patient will have an issue and advise the patient accordingly to keep that patient away from surgery. So your goal is also to keep patients away from you. Really, in spine surgery, you want to prevent surgery in all patients. And this sound, may sound like a, like a sin, but it is the truth. You want to prevent surgery. That's your goal. Uh, uh, and, you know, some people may disagree with me, but really, I try to keep everybody away from the OR. Uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. So there is a mismatch that you have to look at. If you measure the angle between uh, the difference between the angle of lumbar lordosis, for example, and uh, pelvic incidence, and if it's more than 10 degrees, usually according to the literature, there is a, a, a bigger chance of adjacent level disease or a rate of a revision. And there's plenty of literature to, to, to see. We're not going to discuss every article. But the, the, the basic measurements, is, this is an example of what I do for my, my own patients. Uh, I measure the, the 90 degree and a midpoint in between the femur heads and that's the pelvic incidence. I compare with the lumbar lordosis. As, as, in the, in, as you can see in this case, it's a significant um, uh, mismatch uh, between both measurements. Uh, this patient is in severe sagittal uh, imbalance, positive sagittal balance. Uh, this is before and after. but but it's not just applying force to the spine. It's knowing where and how to apply force to the spine, what implants to use or not to use. Um, and at the same time, you want to do the whole process by diminishing pain, diminishing complications, and diminishing um, uh, operative time and blood loss. In this case, it's a two-day procedure where on a, a Tuesday I do... Uh, lateral slash oblique approaches for correcting the coronal imbalance and do indirect decompression, for example, on a Thursday, then I do a posture approach. Um, so now the question is, uh, do we only have to do only, use only bi-dimensional uh, images for planning? And can we use a three-dimensional uh, tool for planning? And that's what I'm going to show you now. I'm going to, so what I started using is, is this three-dimensional tool. Um, to not only try to simulate surgery before the actual surgery, but also to try to put the same measurements that I showed you on the X-ray, but all in the 3D uh, and 3D model. But you can tell me, you know, the 3D model is not standing, right? The 3D model is just floating in space. Well, we corrected that by using an angle in between the vertical and the femurs, the line of the femurs, or in between the horizontal and the sacred slope. And when you translate that angle that you see on the standing X-ray into the 3D model, then you see the actual 3D model when in 3D model standing up. And this is really like seeing the patient standing up. So if you uh, give me one second, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. Um, and I'm gonna share 
I'm gonna allow um, Mike Miller to share his screen. If you have any questions, please stop me. I'm happy to respond. So there you go. Thank you. So in this case, for example, thank you, Mike. Uh, so in this case, for example, you can see the spine of this patient uh, before surgery. Um, and you can see the pelvic incidence is a measure in between both femur heads, uh, the midpoint, and you can have an angle uh, there. The lumbar lordosis is a little more difficult to achieve, but it's basically from the bottom of L5 to the top of L1, we can see the mismatch. And the, the beauty of using 3D modeling for spine surgery is to really see things that you cannot necessarily see on a 2D image as easy as if you would. For example, here, I see that this patient has osteophytes that are lateral, that are very difficult to correct. Sometimes they need an osteotomy. Um, uh, I see that there is a uh, coronal imbalance. Uh, and let me see. Um, if I show you this, for example, you see there osteophytes, osteophytes. So really, it gives you a better idea of your surgical plan. Also, if you want to correct spinal deformity, it's not just putting a bunch of screws and bending the rod. That's not what we do. Um, you can use your uh, part of your uh, tool uh, box as a spine surgeon to uh, place interbody grafts to correct spinal deformity in one stage, and therefore reducing blood loss, reducing pain, and operative time. Uh, Mike, would you mind showing me with the other structures, the vascular structures, please? <clears throat> thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so here, right? Perfect. So it gives you a relationship uh, between the vascular structures and uh, and your targets for surgery. In this case, I decided to do to use a right-sided approach. This is the right side to do interbody fusions at three levels and therefore correct the deformity in a coronal plane. But as you can see, and you saw before, before, uh, uh, before in 2Ds, you see a, almost like a flat back, kyphotic lower back, but also in the sagittal plane. So I used an oblique approach in this case to correct the uh, deformity on both planes at the same time by placing the cage in an oblique, in an oblique fashion. So uh, now I'm going to show you um, can we show the, how we break it? Yeah. So now I'm going to show you sort of how we plan surgery and plan the correction before the surgery. And this is a good patient too as well. You know, going out of, out of the, the, getting out of your doctor bubble and trying to show it to a patient. Uh, it's really uh, educational for patients because then the patient knows exactly what you're doing. Um, so this is 5-1, right? So if, if, we, if we separate the segments at the level of 5-1, and uh, you can see that uh, the spine is moving. If let's say I put a cage at the level of L5-S1 and expand the cage, I can calculate that I'm correcting approximately, let's say three degrees or four degrees in the coronal plane, which might cut in four or five, please. You can see there uh, what, what it would look like after you do each level of the spine before surgery. Um, and now we're going to go into L4-5 there. Now at L45, it's a lateral uh, approach, meaning in general terms, uh, without getting too technical, uh, through a lateral approach, I can get a, a, a bigger graft, a taller graft, and potentially restore height better than as a, a, a posterior approach or a TLF approach. As you can see there, I'm trying to correct about five degrees uh, on the coronal plane. So if I do, if I sum two degrees plus five times three, it's, uh, it's over 15 degrees of coronal correction, which actually helped me quite a bit in this case. I didn't have to do um, big osteotomies, which in spine will be pedicle subtraction osteotomies or asymmetric PSOs. I just had to do interbody fusions, interbody grafts. Uh, you may, you know, in this case, you may encounter osteophytes, but it's, it's, it shouldn't be a, too much uh, of an issue to, to perform a, a mild osteotomy uh, from a lateral approach. Uh, and then at the level of three, four, uh, as you can see in green, then we separate after correcting each level, then we go to the next level above. Uh, so it tells you where, I, it tells me where I need to do the correction, how many degrees of correction and what implants and how, what angle of approach I need to use. Um, 
would you mind showing the before and after? And uh, from the top, yeah. yeah so this is oops. three, and this is the final. This is the final plan. Right, OK. Yeah, you want to out yeah thank you. Who's that not there yet? Oh, it's not there. So it's the plan, right? Yeah. So this is the before and after plan. This is without even the surgery. This is what I'm doing when I'm planning surgery for this patient. Um, I'm seeing that this is the correction. If I correct it up to, I believe this is L2, right? L2. So from five, from L5 to L2 with interbody grafts only, without osteotomies, without laminectomies, uh, this is how much correction. This is a measure that I, I'm going to send to uh, as an abstract for NAS. Uh, I call it the uh, top view uh, translation. Uh, and it's basically the difference between where the patient was and where the patient should be ideally to put that patient in neutral. And then would you mind comparing that with the final? And I'm going to show you the final CT scan and it, it superimposes exactly with my plan. So that really is a good tool, I think, to, to not only plan your surgery, but achieve the surgery as you planned it initially in a three-dimensional fashion. So um, this patient, um, this patient did very well uh, with, uh, with no, no complications, uh, um, taking in, into account the complications of complex spine surgery, especially those colleges are up to, their rates go up to 40% uh, plus sometimes. Uh, but this, this uh, patient did really well. Um, you know, I, I won't discuss the, uh, the risks of doing a lateral or oblique approach in this case, but we can, we can have it as another, uh, as another talk. So that's, uh, that's the final result. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that's final result with uh, correction of the coronal imbalance and cytosol as well. Um, be, because we go past the trochoidal junction uh, into the lower thoracic spine to have a good foundation, I do um, in this case uh, pelvic pelvic fixation. So let me stop the share there and, and show you something else. Um, so I show you all this. So this is before and after. Um, there. Um, I, I think uh, I think all this all this planning is really is really interesting. To some surgeons, it may be very tedious or maybe a waste of time, but it really it really uh, gives you uh, it's really fruitful at the end uh, for the patient. Uh, and then you see a patient that is very satisfied, standing upright without a brace with no radiculopathy. Um, yeah, do, do you have any questions by chance? Yes, please uh, send your questions in the chat box. So feel free to ask, the, ask directly uh, through the microphone. Um, yeah, so uh, I will begin with one. Uh, I saw the images from surgical theater. It, they are very interactive uh, to play with. Um, it has, um, I actually was wondering if there is any kind of um, uh, level of a uh, I mean, accuracy between the, the anatomy of the actual structure and then when it's translated to the uh, 3D image, is it the measures of the vertebrae are exactly the same or there might be some kind of um, slight differences of the measurements uh, that might differ when you are actually on the operating room? Uh, I mean, the, the, there must be some um, uh, differences, uh, millimetric differences on the on the volumes of bone, but overall it allows me to see the overall alignment of the spine. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the margin of error is, but it must be a couple millimeters uh, when you compare the true anatomy of the patient and the anatomy and the, and the 3D the 3D model. Uh, but I'm not sure of that uh, uh, deviation yet. I, I don't know exactly what's the error. Um, so yeah, the, the the other the other part is that you you know obviously this is an approximation of what the patient's looking uh, upright because the images on the um, on the scoliosis films are different than images on a CT scan where the patient is laying down. So that's a very important point. We're trying to approximate on how the patient's standing up and and according to starting with that, then try to correct that model to plan your surgical approach. So yeah, okay, that sounds great. 
Um, so as you can see here, uh, I think it's uh, it's important to make these measurements. And not only what I what I notice about this tool um, is also a teaching tool because I don't have a video here, but it has a function to actually uh, place pedicle screws on the spine as if you were, as if you were doing freehand technique without X-rays, and then looking at the image and see if you fail or if you have a medial breach or a violation of the pedicle. So it is, it can be used as a resident teaching tool. Uh, and that's another application of this. Um, I think that, uh, let me see. <clears throat> I think we're getting, we're running out of time soon, but uh, a couple a couple other things that I want to share with you. Um, you know, I wanted to invite you to, to join uh, the group uh, of USA Latin American Neurosurgical Community. It's, it's, it's really an informal way to discuss cases and balance ideas uh, among each other and, and learn from each other uh, as, as a group of friends. Uh, I, I, I believe that um, I believe that the the old dogma of uh, uh, um, you know I, I have the privilege of working in the USA and I have the privilege of working uh, working neurosurgery, but I think that the playing field needs to be leveled. And I want to give back to Latin America, so I, th I feel like at least in neurosurgery, the playing field needs to be even. And we we should be practicing the same way with the same standards. So I would like to uh, I like to give back to my my roots uh, by this. Uh, this is where I'm from, uh, South America. It's a place very dear to my heart. And uh, I invite you to, to join the Spine Club. It's, uh, it's a, another informal way to uh, discuss spine cases. We'll be doing monthly meetings online or soon to ask questions and and do an informal way to to learn from each other. Not only with South American surgeons, but surgeons from all over the world. Um, I learned something from uh, a mentor of mine a long time ago, and uh, he told me that uh, having a being a winner is an attitude; it's not a goal. Um, and it's really uh, an attitude. Uh, you know, I, I learned that the obstacles that are sometimes the obstacles are not the physical ones; the obstacles are the mental ones. That the most important obstacles to be successful in anything, and to be able to to treat patients. Uh, adequately is it's, uh, sometimes it's a mental obstacle to know when to do something and when not to do uh, surgery. Uh, and other things that I learned is uh, every operation is the operation. It's not one more operation. It's not a laminectomy. It's not a fusion. It's the operation. This is the one thing that you have to learn as medical students when you're going to do a procedure, your first procedure as an attending or as a fellow is that's the operation of the day. That's, you have to be present in that moment, okay? Uh, this, is, this is probably something that you don't learn a lot, not even in residency and not even in fellowship, is how to think. How to think when you're proceeding, when you're deciding, and when you're performing. Uh, there's, there's some uh, mental tricks that I will mention here before I finish. Uh, one is visualization. And this is a huge uh, area of psychology. Visualization is something that I'll learn Actually, I learned some during my uh, training in spine, spine surgery and neurosurgery. Uh, you, you think of the surgery as when you're scrubbing before going into the operating room, you think in, three dimension, in a three-dimensional plane, um, in three dimensions, what you're about to do. So when you come into the OR, things flow a lot easier. So you perform surgery a lot smoother and you think on your alternatives, your plan B, your plan C. Visualization is huge. And sometimes when there's a very interesting, at least to me, very interesting complex spine surgery the next day, I, I catch myself thinking of the surgery while I'm having dinner or when I'm looking at TV without being disrespectful of whoever is with me. But you catch yourself just going through the surgery in your mind. And that's huge. Visualization is an, is an enormous tool that I confirm visualization being an enormous tool, not only in surgery, but to perform uh, is uh, performance science and performance psychology. When you do performance in sports, for example, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge tool for spine surgery and cranial surgery. If you have the surgery already done in your mind, you will perform better uh, in the OR, okay? That's my two cents, my personal opinion, 100%. No failure, no, no fail. You can't go wrong with visualizing the surgery before you do it or visualizing any performance before you, before you, you attempt it. Um, 
why do I mention flow psychology? That's another big topic in psychology. Flow psychology is the state in which nothing else matters. You're completely present and you, you have constant feedback, positive or negative. So you're completely immersed in, uh, in the activity. You should uh, read the book. Uh, it's a little green book that I, if you send me a, a message, I can send you the link. It's, it's called Flow Psychology. And it's basically when, what is, I think it explains why we as surgeons love surgery so much. Because when we're in the OR, nothing else is present, only here and now. In surgery, not, nothing else is, uh, it matters for that hour, two, three, six, ten 10 hours of surgery, but what you're doing. And it's, it's a, it to, to a degree, it's a positive experience for the mind uh, because you're completely present. There's no sense of time. Uh, and, and when you lo lose sense of time, you, you I, I think to a degree, you become a little happier uh, because you, you're completely uh, detached from uh, your own needs and you basically are serving a patient. Uh, and, and that's a beautiful thing. I, I apply that to sports and I happen to be in my pastime uh, competitive freediver. So I was able to apply visualization and flow psychology to what I did. And even without having a lot of time to train in freediving, being a neurosurgeon, God forbid to, train, to do have time, free time for anything. Uh, I was able to, um, to achieve a couple um, national records for my home country. Uh, so I, just like in the OR, um, uh, just like in the OR, when you perform for sports, visualization and being present are, are huge uh, mental techniques. Uh, um, also, um, another very powerful technique uh, to perform in the OR, as in sports, is uh, um, thought control and awareness. When you are aware of your thoughts and you look at your thoughts and identify your thoughts and look at them for what they are, you really can perform better. Even when you're under stress, even when the patient is very sick, you can perform and stay on the path uh, of treatment. Uh, that, that, I think that's huge. I don't have a lot of time to explain to you uh, too much uh, about that, but I think um, uh, if, if you reach out to me, I'll be happy to explain to you more. Uh, so, uh, and again, for medical students, uh, which is most of the audience, primo no noche is, is huge. Do not harm. That's the one thing you can do. Uh, please, please have that in your minds and your hearts at all times. You always put the patient first. Uh, you need to understand what you want in, in neurosurgery if you want to go into neurosurgery. Uh, understand what you need. Understand the business of neurosurgery and business of medicine as well. Uh, you have to understand what is, uh, why decisions are taken and whatnot. Uh, uh, I think uh, embedding yourself by learning is it's always the, the right answer. Um, if, if any of you want to uh, come to Tampa, Florida to observe surgeries or, or uh, maybe learn of whatever I can give to you, please reach out to me. I will be delighted to teach you whatever you want, whatever I can. I don't have all the answers, uh, uh, but sometimes, sometimes more important than having the right answers is having the right questions. When you have the right questions on what, why, and what's the next step, sometimes that's better. Uh, than trying to have all the answers. Uh, and that's, that's about it. I, I'm, I'm very honored to have been sharing 45 minutes with you. Uh, thank you. I hope I didn't make it too complex or too simple or too, uh, I don't know. I hope it was uh, to your liking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valdivia. That was very insightful. And actually, m most of the comments that we are receiving now is actually uh, on greatness for, for your talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions, really William. Done. You have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, I was thinking about uh, how do you uh, always plan all the operations, but I, I was, well, uh, was also thinking that when you face an unexpected situation in your operation, uh, what's, your, what's your procedure? I mean, do you usually um, wait uh, to results? Uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, you send some some exams, some additional exams, or you try to to act in, in that moment in order to to um uh, in order <laughs> to solve that problem. I mean there are two ways and actually I, I don't know what I would do if I face a, a problem and maybe it I think that it's 
uh, something that I could solve in that moment, but maybe uh, I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know what I will do. So I, I I am asking because of that, and I don't know if you understood my my ask me question. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, um, that's something that you don't learn overnight, I think. And I am still learning that. Uh, if I told you that I have, I have mastered all the uh, superpowers of surgery, I would be lying to you. I mean, surgeons learn throughout their surgical careers. And when you, uh, when you face uh, the unexpected, you have to persevere and think. Uh, and remember that you when we're working as neurosurgeons, we are constantly um, caring for others. It's not necessarily for yourself. You're caring for others. That's what makes it tough sometimes. So when you face an unexpected event, you have to think what's best for that patient at that moment, either abort surgery, proceed with surgery, get another exam, or implement another treatment. You have to think of the patient first and that patient's safety. Um, it's uh, it's counter nice, uh, so it's um, maybe nonsensical to, uh, I'm telling you to be present and think of the present, et cetera, and in, in surgery, you have to be in the present. But uh, so uh, evolution was achieved by thinking on the future, right? So you have to think on the future of that patient. And as a spine surgeon, you just don't treat a snapshot of that patient's, that patient's life. You're treating that patient and trying to predict how likely is that patient to worsen after what you did and how likely you're able to prevent other issues in that patient's life. And that's our job. Our job is to be surgeons, but also to have a little bit of a crystal ball to try to get keep that patient away from issues, away from problems. Um, but to your question, you just have to. Uh, I think the the more uh, the more the more experience that you have during surgery, the more you will learn on how to stop and think uh, and analyze the situation. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you, Dr. Valdivia. I have another question regarding the, the platform, Surgical Theater. Uh, are they considering expanding to the medical education uh, branch? Uh, maybe uh, these beautiful uh, or interactive uh, interfaces can be applied for the neuroanatomy classes, for example. Um, that is something that you have to discuss with the company. Uh, I don't I don't work for the company, uh, but I think it's a very good question. I personally think that that tool can be used for medical education 100%. And, and for um, not only for education of anatomy, for, for education of surgical procedures and simulation, surgical simulation. Yes, there is an application in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, sounds great. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, Meanwhile, uh, we would like to thank uh, the platform Neurosurgical TV for uh, sharing with us uh, this uh, space and also the team, Dr. Bennett and, and the, the students teams that follow them. Um, and also be beforehand, we, we would like to thank Dr. Valdivia for his time and consideration to uh, cooperate with Walter Dandy Club in Peru uh, to make this uh, presentation available for us. Um, there were some people that were also uh, watching us through the platforms of Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we, we thank you for your attention too. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out through Instagram and we are aiming to expand our clubs uh, in, the whole, uh, in the whole provinces of Peru uh, to expand the knowledge uh, like this wonderful presentation that we have today. Thank you. And, and I want to thank Dr. Bennett for allowing us to, to have that platform. Dr. Bennett, I don't know if you're still with us. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And, yeah, uh, yes, Dr. Valdivia, I'd like to thank you for an excellent presentation and invite you to have a, have a conference in Spanish or English on spine for Latin America. Uh, I'll be delighted. Thank you. It will be my honor to... to uh, yeah, it'd be my honor to share anything I can share with you guys. And 
Yeah, I think we live close by, doctor. I think I, you know, I think you're in Florida, so please feel free to reach out if you ever come to Tampa. We can go diving sometime. Okay? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, one last question that comes from the attendees. Rocio Casimiro says, a question about the man you saw on Cusco. Um, even if the man is in evident pain uh, and, and he doesn't reach out for help, uh, can we intervene? I mean, yeah, well, so, okay, that, that's, a, that's a very deep question. Uh, um, that's a very deep question. It's, that's not just about spine surgery. That's about medicine in general. And I, 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 I'm of the idea that we can intervene when the patient wants us to intervene, right? Because you are, we are giving a service. I, I, I saw that, that, that gentleman, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, I would, I would never, I don't think where I would see that in the world, but in Peru, like, uh, you know, 80 something year old with severe, severe kyphosis, taking almost half an hour to go, go down the stairs to go sell merchandise. Uh, not with no assistance, but just taking forever. So I, you know, I said, hey, you need some help. He just basically told me to not bother him. <laughs> and uh, he did not have any pain. He was trying to sell. He was trying to survive. So no, then I just, I, I didn't have to do anything. I just admired uh, how um, it's not the pathology we're treating. It's the patient. It's the symptoms. And spine surgery is all about symptoms. It's all about the symptoms. Uh -huh. So is, is you, you cannot tell, you cannot recommend surgery, for example, if the patient has scoliosis, but the patient is walking upright and having no pain. Uh, unless, but well, you have to, so the, the, I would say, let me, let me make, be clear, the, the job at the duty of the surgeon is to educate the patient and offer all the options and the risks and the benefits and the patient to take an informed and educated decision. That's what are, that's your job. Uh -huh. So, uh, so uh, to your question is not what I want, it's what the patient wants. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's actually the question that follows the autonomy principle of medicine as well. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Valdivia. And uh, Rocio says, thank you for your answer. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, we will stay in touch in the future. Have a, a nice uh, Saturday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice Saturday. Dr. Valdivia, goodbye. It was a very goodbye. great exposure. Thank, thank you. you, guys. And thank you, Dr. Bennett, again. Have a thank good you. one. Thank you.